Alright, awesome guys. Um, so I usually send out the lesson just via email. This is one that I highly recommend that you pull up just because we are going to be going over baptism with the Holy Spirit. So as a church, we've been doing these first principle studies and ending off with the follow-up studies, pretty much just understanding and growing in depth about what the Bible says clearly and establishing a strong foundation as a Christian. And so the next thing we're going to be talking about tonight is baptism with the Holy Spirit. So this is a subject that is highly misunderstood in most of Christendom. Um, on one hand, you have the charismatic movement that believe that every Christian has to experience Holy Spirit baptism and have miraculous gifts accompany it. So that would be something that you would understand <laughs> as the Pentecostal movement. Everyone has to be, have the Holy Spirit baptism and you should speak in tongues and do other things like that. So that's one hand. On the other hand, you have those who spiritualize water baptism and claim that it's Holy Spirit baptism and it's an inner experience that saves you. Both of these viewpoints aren't actually right, and what they really do is they get scriptures and they twist it up to have this particular point of view. Mm -hmm. And so the purpose of this lesson, it is a teaching lesson, it is a lot in it, I'm going to do as best as I can on, to hit the concise point so that it really just highlights what we are to specifically learn about the Holy Spirit baptism, but it's just going to be setting the purpose of what was it, does it still exist today? And why or why not? So point number one is the purpose. What is the purpose of the Holy Spirit baptism? So as we read here in Luke 3, 15 through 18, it says the people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize with water, but the one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. His willing fork will be in his hand to clear his threshing floor, to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. We can stop there. Pretty much is talking about what it says here, John prophesying and talking about Jesus who's about to come. He's saying he's going to baptize with two things, one with the Holy Spirit and the other one with fire. The first thing we need to at least understand is the word baptism. In the, word, in the Greek word, when it was written here, it means baptismo, which means to be fully immersed as opposed to being dwelled in by. So people will use baptism with the Holy Spirit as you're being indwelled by the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean that. It means to be fully immersed by the Holy Spirit. So first of all, we see it's going to be promised that it says that, hey, that there's going, um, that when Jesus comes, this is going to happen. It's going to happen with Jesus coming. He also talks about the baptism of fire, which is, most would understand this, is to referring to the judgment against the unbelieving Jews. This would be described as the destruction of Judaism in about 70 AD, where Jesus' ministry was mainly between 30 to 33, 32 AD. And so this was like 40 years later that the, the destruction of the temple was going to happen. So we see here in Malachi 4.1 that talks about this even before in the Old Testament, the destruction or the Jews were going were gonna to face judgment. So Malachi 4, one. surely the day is coming and it will burn like a furnace, or the arrogant and every evildoer will be uh, stubble. Um, and the day that is coming will set on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or branch will be left to them. So the baptism of the Spirit is referring to a blessing for a group, as we see here, that when Jesus comes, he's going to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So it's something that's promised. So point number two, what was the purpose of it? First, we're going to look at what the purpose was not, what others claim they think it is. So the purpose of the Holy Spirit was not the following. First of all, it was not to enable people to do miracles. Jesus' disciples were already doing these things. We see here in Matthew 10, 1, he called his 12 disciples to him and gave them the authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. This is before the Holy Spirit baptism has already come. Luke 10, 17. The 72 disciples, those who they, they were, returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. So this is already prior to the Holy Spirit baptism. Okay, what it is not is to inspire people as prophets. When people ever say, well, I have the inspiration of the word of God. I have the Holy Spirit speaking through me. Well, this was already happening. 
This is already happening all throughout the hundreds of years in the Old Testament. In Zechariah 7.12, it says, They made their hearts as hard as flint and would not listen to the law or the words that the Lord Almighty has sent by His Spirit through the earlier prophets. So the Lord Almighty was very angry. So the Holy Spirit baptism wasn't something for everyone. It's already through specific prophets that Jesus, or excuse me, God was already in inspiring His word to come from. Number three is it was not to fill the people with the Spirit. John's baptism was filled with the, uh, excuse me, so it was not to fill people with the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist was already filled with the Holy Spirit since birth. So he didn't need the Holy Spirit baptism to do that. Since birth, he already had the Holy Spirit. We see here in Luke 1, 15, it says, For he, speaking about John, will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drinks, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. So we see here that if John already had it, and I know he was somebody quite specific, but it, 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 it wasn't that purpose. It wasn't the purpose to fill people with the Holy Spirit. And even here, that the Christians are commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit always. Meaning, it didn't just come from John, uh, the Holy Spirit baptism. They're always commanded to be, have, be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you read here in Ephesians 5, 18 through 19, mainly the beginning part, we'll just read. It says, do not be drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, mm -hmm. be filled with the Holy Spirit. That did not just come with the baptism, but it's something that we continuously have to do. The fourth thing that it is not the purpose of is to save someone. The Spirit indwells in a Christian after he's saved in Acts chapter 2, 38. So we read here as we know these scriptures, but it says, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes after your sins have already um, been forgiven in the waters of baptism. Galatians 4, uh, 6 talks about this as well. Because you are my sons, meaning because you are saved, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit that uh, who calls out, Abba, Father. So looking at each one of these things, we see what it is not. It is not to enable miracles. It is not to inspire people to speak the words of God. It is not to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it is not for salvation. So we see here at the end that actually the baptism of the Holy Spirit is never commanded in the Bible. It's not something that is specifically said that you need to receive this. The only baptism that is ever commanded is in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. So only one that is ever commanded. So the purpose of the Holy Spirit baptism was to mark the beginning of the kingdom of God, the church. So when the Spirit came, the apostles would receive special powers connected with witnessing to the whole world. And we see here that this was prophesied, or this was talked about by Jesus before he left to heaven in Acts chapter 1, 4 through 8. So it says here, on one occasion, while he was still eating, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. This is Jesus even prophesying or talking about it's surely to come. Then he gathered. Uh, then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Lord has sent on his own authority, but you will receive power from uh, when the Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So, even Jesus, and we read this before, if you've been around as we've been doing these lessons, the Kingdom of God study, that Jesus is saying, hey, it's going to come soon, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but this is to usher in the Kingdom of God. This is something that was prophesied all the way in 750 with Isaiah. So, Acts chapter 2 describes this baptism as pouring out of the Spirit. And it's, a, it's a good thing to know these wordings, the pouring out of the Spirit and baptize with. So we see here in Acts chapter 2, 17 through 18, later on when it's already happened, it says in a prophecy uh, quoted by Joel, it says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I'll pour out my Spirit in those days. 
and they will prophesy. So this occurred, and it marked the gathering of the Jews into Christ's kingdom in Acts chapter 2. Um, the only other mention of the spirit, the spirit baptism is in Acts uh, as well, excuse me, Acts chapter 2 and only in Acts chapter 11. And this is referring to the Gentiles now being entering the kingdom of God. God has already promised, he says, hey, this is for everyone, right? He said, Jerusalem, Judea, and all the ends of the earth. They didn't really understand that. In the beginning, they only really evangelized to Jews. Mm -hmm. And God gets to this point, it's like, guys, you've got to usher in the Gentiles as well. Mm -hmm. So Acts chapter 11, this is the purpose of it, mm -hmm. is now he's starting to usher the Gentiles into the kingdom of God, into his church. So we read here in 15 through 16. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them, as had it come on us at the beginning. Mm -hmm. This is them talking about, in the beginning, Peter talking about the beginning. When was that? That was in Acts chapter 2. Then I remembered what the Lord has said. John will baptize with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in Jesus, excuse me, Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? So this is Peter just talking about, hey, I've seen it. The kingdom get ushered to the Jews, but now I'm seeing it get ushered into the Gentiles. That God is now allowing the Jews who were part of the Old Covenant, and now the Gentiles, pretty much anybody who wasn't Jewish, that can now enter the kingdom of God. So we see the purpose is not for salvation or anything else, but its main purpose was to usher people into the kingdom of God. Mm. And usher the kingdom of God now here on earth. So definition. So looking back into it, right, what I was talking about pouring out in the, the baptism. Um, remember, baptized means to be fully immersed. Mm -hmm. And when you're pouring out, think of it more of like God's point of view. So in Acts 2, 16 through 17, we already read it, but it says in the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. So the pouring out is kind of like from God's point of view. In his point of view, he's pouring out the spirit onto the earth. In our point of view, we see the spirit coming on us, and not really see it, but we feel it or whatever happens. The spirit is now immersing us. We're getting baptized. We're fully immersed. Pouring out is God's point of view. Baptized is our point of view. And so it's kind of like if you had um, like a coin, right? If you had a coin on, on a table. The coin, if you get a glass and you pour out the water onto the coin, the coin's getting baptized, fully immersed in water. But from the cup's point of view, the spirit is getting poured out. Mm -hmm. So that's just a way of thinking it and understanding what it meant when Jesus was saying, Hey, or when uh, Peter was saying that God was going to pour out his spirit. What this means is that, see, in the Old Testament, there was a very select few who received the Holy Spirit. You have King David, you have other prophets, you have uh, uh, Elijah. Um, many specific people were, 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 have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit or had the indwelling Holy Spirit. In now the New Covenant, we have the opportunity that every single person who wants to come to Christ can have the Holy Spirit. So God is now allowing it to be poured out to the world. Anybody can have it. That was a crazy thing from a Jewish perspective. When you met somebody with the Holy Spirit back in the Old Testament, like, whoa, King David has the Holy Spirit? Wow, this guy, like, I, I want to meet somebody. Like, I wonder if I get to live in a time where the Holy Spirit was mm. even on the earth. That's how rare it was. There was times where people were in the... Israel, uh, in Israel, in the nation of Israel, in the Jewish covenant, and still like, man, nobody has a Holy Spirit. I wish that one person would have it. And now we're part of the new covenant where everyone has the opportunity to get it. So that's what it means by it being poured out, that everyone has an opportunity to receive it now. So, again, that once um, baptism has occurred... It is now um, only for certain people. Now everyone has an opportunity to receive it. So, however, this does not mean just because we everyone has an opportunity to receive the Holy Spirit doesn't mean the Holy Spirit works in every single per uh, person the same way. So, some people you don't have the opportunity to. Um, in the, the apostles, when they have the Holy Spirit, they have the opportunity to pass on the gifts. But well, that's not uh, 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 something that we can do anymore. Even actually, when the Bible, or excuse me, when the Holy Spirit gave gifts to people, they weren't all the same gifts, actually. We read here in 1 Corinthians 12, 28-30. Sorry, I'm skipping over a bit because we're going to address that in a, a later lesson. But if you look at number 3, it's still in the purpose. It says, 
Um, those that had the gifts weren't all the same thing. In 1 Corinthians 12, 28-30, it says, And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles. Then gives us healings of helping, of guidance, and different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have the gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? He's asking these questions as, of course not. Not everyone's a prophet. Not everyone's an apostle. In the same way, not everyone's going to have these gifts, even during that time. So that really combats even the charismatic movement today, where they believe, hey, everyone has to receive the gift of the Holy, excuse me, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and have the gifts accompanying with it. Actually, here it's saying not everyone's going to receive those things. Not everyone's going to be able to do miracles. And we're going to understand the gifts of the Holy Spirit later on in my lesson on Sunday. And so we're going to hold that off for a moment of why um, we don't see people doing healing or speaking in tongues biblically anymore. So the need of the miraculous gifts ceased when the New Testament was completely written in, in written form. So in John chapter 20, verse 30 through 31, we at least get to understand the purpose of us having the Holy Scriptures today. It says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is a Messiah and the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So this is just clearly stating back then, um, how would you know if someone was from God or were they just speaking random things and creating some own religion? Well, the Jews had a very strenuous and very um, strict kind of... Um, uh, a set of regiments that you had to make before they would believe, are you from God or not? One of them is that you had to do miracles. If you were going to claim to be a prophet, you had to accompany, be accompanied by with miracles. Mm -hmm. And the main point of that is that so that people would believe you. People can say, oh, you're doing a miracle? Okay, so now I can understand that you're from God. Now it's saying we don't need that anymore. We don't need to believe in any other random person. Why? Because now we have the scriptures to believe in Christ. Mm -hmm. So the Holy Spirit baptism then... Uh, was the coming of the Holy Spirit into the world um, in an overwhelming measure. Again, anybody can have it, not just a select few. See, in the same way, though, we can kind of reflect with, though that the Holy Spirit was being poured out on the earth, doesn't mean everyone automatically received it. Kind of think of it this way. Just because Jesus died for everyone so that they have an opportunity to get their lives right with God, doesn't mean that automatically saved every single person. Now they have the opportunity to have a right relation with God. In the same way, God has poured out the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean automatically everyone receives it. It means now he's giving people an opportunity to do so. So we read here in Hebrews 5, 9, it says, And once being made perfect, uh, become the source of eternal salvation for those who obey him. Meaning that the Holy Spirit was given to those that were obeying him. Um, actually, even more so, it talks about this as the indwelling Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, and uh, Acts 5, 32. Mainly in verse 32, if you read the Acts 5, 32 one, I think this one really is cool about who receives the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It says, We are witnesses of those things, and so is the Holy Spirit, who God has given to those who obey Him. Mm. So the Holy Spirit isn't just given to everybody, it's given to those who are obeying Him, who are living as His disciples. So point number four, you can see that um, the case of Cornelius, um, Acts chapter 10, we're going to read from Acts 10, 1 to 11, 18. Now, I know this is going to bore everyone, so what I'm going to get you guys to do is we're going to take turns reading five scriptures each so everyone follows along, okay? Start off to my left. Um, I want you to read five scriptures, and then right when they're done, the next person kind of jumps up. Tim, you don't have to read. That's okay. If you want to, you can. But um, we'll go five each, and that should get to everyone and can come back to me. Is that cool? Easy. So verse 1, Tegan's going to read that. Okay. It says, At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God, who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon, 
the tanner whose house is by the sea. When the, when the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon of the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheep being led down to earth by its four corners. It contains all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles of the earth, birds of the air. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times and immediately the, the sheep was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the Centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day Peter started out with them and some of the brothers from Joppa went along. The following day he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. Pascal. Oh, but Peter made him, um, him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. Talking with them, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are all aware that this it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. But God has shown me that I, would, I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when, so when I sent for you, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, Four days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me. And said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remember your gifts to the poor. Send to Chocpa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon, the tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do not and do what is right. You know the message God sent to, to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what it what was what has happened throughout Galilee, uh, beginning in Ga in Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism uh, that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appoint, appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, 
Can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him. And said, You went into the house of the of circumcised, uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as they had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. Then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, Surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. And then it was all put up to ever again. Uh, right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. The six brother also went with me and we, went. we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us in the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gifts as he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? Oh. Uh, 18, please. Oh. When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. Awesome. So I know you guys were probably just thinking about what you were going to have to read. Uh, <laughs> but pretty much. So, shorter version. Um, <laughs> Peter gets a vision from God, and he's saying, hey, all these animals are now clean to eat, which is kind of him foreshadowing and saying, hey, the Gentiles are not unclean anymore. They can enter the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. So the Jews, they always had all these animals they can't eat. They can't have the, uh, the one with the hooves and everything. But they're always saying, it's all clean. Don't say things that are unclean that God has now made clean. And he's made clean the Gentiles to enter the kingdom of God. But you see here, even when Peter gets told by the centurion, that, hey, come enter my house, they still had these rules of Judaism that they were following. They're like, hey, I can't enter that house. But because I saw this vision, I came to enter this house. He was still leaving. Peter that was leaving the church was still living in this kind of like legalism, Judaism still. And so it's funny. Peter gets this, this vision saying, hey, you need to come to Cornelius' house. He shows up to the house. He's like, hey, why did you guys bring me here? And Cornelius says, hey, we got a vision as well. Why did you come? So it's like both of them don't know what the heck's going on. Peter then like, oh, okay, I understand now. God's giving me the vision that even the Gentiles can now enter the kingdom of God. So remember that Peter, just like in Acts chapter 2, um, was told that he was going to be the one given the keys to the kingdom? Mm -hmm. He still has it. P God is still using Peter to usher people into the kingdom. So he goes there and he's kind of preaching the same lesson. Starts talking about Jesus. And then they start to receive the the baptism or the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. And you see here, it says that they're all astonished. The believing Jews that were there, they're like, whoa, God's even pouring the Holy Spirit, something so, you know, holy, like even on the Gentiles, they hear him speaking in tongues. Now, speaking in tongues is not what modern Christianity will say it means. People will say, I grew up in a, in a Pentecostal church where it means utterances. Blah, 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 blah. And that's not what it means. It means actually speaking in other known languages. Meaning, I randomly, one moment, start speaking German, Timoteo speaking Tongan, random stuff. And so it wasn't that they started, well, oh, no, homie's not having a seizure, he's, he's having miracles from God. And so that's what they got to see. They're like, wow, you know, okay, these guys are even getting it. 
So we see here the reason of it is that the Jews were not accepting the Gentiles to enter the kingdom of God yet. And so God was doing this extra little purpose to say, hey guys, you need to start ish, uh, issuing the Gentiles into the kingdom of God. And we see here that even after Peter did this, uh, we already read these things, but it says here that Peter had to go and explain himself. The assembly of other uh, Christians say, hey man, why, why are you entering Jewish, uh, excuse me, Gentiles houses? He's like, guys, you don't understand. God is now allowing Gentiles to enter the kingdom of God. I've seen it. Remember when we went through the Holy Spirit baptism? Now, he probably didn't say back in Acts 2, but he meant like, hey, a couple years ago. <laughs> but he's like, hey, do you guys remember that? That's the same thing that happened to the Gentiles. What can stop me from allowing them into the kingdom of God? Mm -hmm. So what was the result of his explanation? The Jews, they were satisfied. They're like, actually, that makes sense. Cornelius was baptized into Christ. Um, doing miracles uh, did not make him a Christian before water baptism. Just because Cornelius and the other people were speaking in tongues did not mean that they were Christians yet. You know, we even here read in Acts chapter uh, 22, 16. It says that um, the only thing that actually saves us and washes away our sin is not miracles, but it is getting baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So Acts 22, verse 16 says this. And now what are you waiting for? Talking about Paul and his conversion. Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name, meaning Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 3, 21, talking about more specifically about water baptism. It says, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good, uh, a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Talking about water baptism, the thing that washes away our sins. I'm not going to read it, but in uh, Matthew 7, 21 through 23, just talks about, hey, people can do miracles. Doesn't mean that they're right with God. Mm -hmm. He's saying those who do my will are the ones that are going to enter heaven. So looking at this special um, circumstance here in Acts chapter 11, I guess the question is, well, is this the second of a, uh, example of the Holy Spirit baptism? Well, possibly. There's two different cases here. The first one that people think is possibly. This is, might be the second case of the Holy Spirit baptism. See, Acts 11.15 is to be a, a, a key consideration when thinking about this point of view. The Holy Spirit came on them as though as has come on us in the beginning. Well, whatever else may be said, the Holy Spirit baptism was not a regular occurrence. It reminded Peter of the beginning, meaning back in Acts chapter 2. This was years apart. And so when this started to happen, this was, I believe, it was like five to seven years after Acts chapter 2. He's saying, in the beginning, it didn't remind them of any other of conversions. Mm -hmm. They baptized 3,000. They got to, to, to 5,000 by Acts chapter 4. He says, no, it doesn't remind me of anything other than like it was in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So since Peter was, again, used... The keys uh, of the kingdom of God, or he had the kingdom of God to usher in the Jews, he had the same keys to usher in the Gentiles. So if this view is correct, baptism in the Holy Spirit was a two-time only occurrence, even in connection with ushering in the kingdom of God to both the Jews and the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. um, certainly this is a logical point of view and does not damage um, basic understanding of our scriptures, but there's another point of view where um, it's saying, well, yeah, it could be possible, but there's another explanation. Is it the second example of the Holy Spirit uh, baptism? Not necessarily. So this is kind of weird wordplay, but in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, talking about, hey, the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out. So this is talking about in, in Joel. He's prophesying it. In future tense, the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out in the last days. In Acts chapter 2, verse 33, says that it has just, Happen. It's the past tense. Acts 2.33, exalted to the right hand of God who has received the Father, uh, the Father, uh, excuse me, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. So it already happened. So Acts, uh, back in Joel, it's future going to happen. Acts 2, it already happened. But in Acts 10.45, it uses this verb as the perfect tense. Meaning, when it says being poured out, it means a past event that is still happening. Mm. So when it's talking about this point of view, when it says the last days, it means that there was literally days that it was going to happen when you're ushering in the Gentiles. 
Okay, it happened day one, but the Gentiles did not get poured out yet. So it, it's continuously happening. So those are just two different point of views, pretty much. Did it happen twice? Or did it happen once, but it was prolonged over a long period of time until the Gentiles received it? So, again, you can kind of pick and choose whatever one that you think. But all in all, we see at least throughout all the conversions in Acts, actually throughout the entire Bible, those are the only two occurrences that it ever happens this way. So, point number five, coming all to a close, is does it still exist? Well, we can read here in Ephesians 5, 4, 4 through 6, that there's only one baptism left. Yeah. It says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So just kind of a fun fact to help us at least understand what this means. In Ephesians, this was written about approximately 60 to 62 A.D., and so what it's teaching here, it says that there is one baptism by the time that this was written. Mm -hmm. So which one? Which baptism is left? We can kind of do like a process of elimination. So the first baptism we have is John's baptism. But we know that that passed away when people started to get baptized in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Right here, Acts 19, 1-5. through 5. It says, when Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through uh, the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we had not even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul answered, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. That is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name, uh, into the name of Lord Jesus. So you see here, even when Paul came across people that were baptized by John in his name. He's like, guys, what are you talking about? John said, get baptized in the name of Jesus, the one coming after him. Mm -hmm. I really love this scripture because so many people will say, hey, well, I received the indwelling Holy Spirit when I started to believe. Well, not here. They, they would have believed and understood Jesus, but he's like, hey, the very first question when he, Paul realizes that they did not receive the Holy Spirit, he didn't ask him, did you believe in Jesus? He didn't ask him, hey, what a part of the gospel do you not understand? The first question he asked them about them having the Holy Spirit or not, it says, what baptism did you receive? He connected 100% uh, on having the indwelling Holy Spirit into baptism. So we see here that John's baptism is, is no longer around. Uh, well, the second one, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we've already kind of talked about it, that it's no longer present because it was prophesied and promised and had already been fulfilled. It was never a command for any Christian to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. So the last baptism that's left is a baptism with water in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of, of sins to receive the dwelling Holy Spirit. So Jesus, again, this is the only command, this is the only baptism that was ever commanded. Uh, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all na nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So this is a bapt baptism that is recorded all the way through the book of Acts and in the epistles. And we even know this because right when... Uh, 1 Peter 3 was being written, that's in about 64 AD, meaning this is even after Ephesians. And we already read this scripture, but it talks about water, right? 1 Peter 3, 21. And this water symbolizes baptism that now say, uh, saves you also. But the, the pledge of a good conscience towards God, it saves you by the resurrection of Christ Jesus. So when it says this water symbolizes, if you want to look back in context, pretty much he's referring back to the, the waters of Noah. He's saying, hey, back in Noah's time, that was a symbol to what was going to happen today. Pretty much that Noah got saved and only eight people with him got saved, but the water that flooded the earth was washing away sin. Pretty much the evil of the earth. And he's saying that water symbolized today baptism. That baptism is now washing away our sin. And why is he talking about uh, because we have a pledge of a good conscience? Because that's where we say Jesus is Lord. This is where we say, hey, God, I have repented before I've entered this water, and I'm making you Lord of my life. I'm coming with complete good, uh, a, a clear conscience. 
And so we see here, even by 64 AD, the only baptism that was left and commanded was the holy, excuse me, the, the baptism in Jesus' name by water. So, in conclusion, does the baptism with the Holy Spirit still exist today? And the easy answer is no. So that's pretty much the end of the lesson, guys. I kind of raced through it quite quickly, just because I know your attention span is going to be going somewhere else. But um, in conclusion, I guess I just want to overemphasize of what all this means. Um, baptism of the Holy Spirit, what was its purpose? It was to usher people into the kingdom of God. To say, remember we did the kingdom study, that there was going to be with power, that awesome things were going to happen. God was now ushering the kingdom of God into the earth. Why did it happen twice? The first time it happened to the Jews that were all gathered in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. Um, and then it happened later on because the Jews didn't really understand or people didn't accept that Gentiles were now people, pretty much when I say Gentiles, people that are not Jewish, could be anybody, that they didn't allow them to enter the kingdom of God. So God said, hey, Peter, let them come in. You have the keys. You're, you're keeping the door locked. Here, I'm going to show you. Let them come in as well. So all in all, baptism of the Holy Spirit does not exist today um, in the way that people would say. People will use different words today. They'll use, instead of baptism of the Holy Spirit, they'll use a believer's baptism. It's essentially the same thing, what they're referring to, but again, it does not exist today. It's never commanded in nowhere through the book of Acts, other than these two occurrences, where you <coughs> find that in someone's conversion. Um, so yeah, so I know that's a lot in there. That's why I did send it out to you guys. Go and look it over for yourself. Uh, develop your own convictions. If you have any questions, I'd like to open it up or any thoughts. Um, I, I'd like to open it up now. So that's pretty much the end of the lesson.